I'm here to introduce a fabulous new game. It's called banking. Everyone's doing it. All you need to play it with are one of these, one of these, one of these, and one of these. Like many in the 1980s, Nick Leeson wanted to be rich and successful. But Nick Leeson was also a very strange man. He had an extraordinary ability to manipulate and deceive those around him. This is his story. It is also the story of those he deceived. They willingly entered into a dream he wove, lured by the prospect of vast sums of money. And together they lost £830 million. Pounds. In 1986, Mrs Thatcher deregulated the City of London. The old division between banks and stockbrokers was removed. The gentlemanly image of the banker was replaced by that of the trader. Nick Leeson was working as a clerk for the giant American bank, Morgan Stanley. On the surface, he appeared just like everyone else in this new world. A boy from the suburbs who wanted to be a trader. It's very easy for me to get on with people, um, but I don't necessarily have to like you um, or any of the people that I work with to get on with them. So I, can, I come in, I do my job, I do it to the best of my ability, and then at the end of the day, if you're going to ask me out for a drink, I'm not going to go out for a drink with you because I don't like you. But I'm not going to tell you that. There's no reason for there to be any animosity during the day. I just didn't like the people that I worked with. And so I would go in, do the work, be very, very friendly. Everybody would probably say that they thought they were my best friend. And if they, if they have the knowledge, then I will attempt to get that knowledge through whichever way is, is best. And if the friendship is that method, then friendship is the method that I would use. In 1989, Leeson asked to become a trader, but Morgan Stanley refused. He decided it was time to move. This time he chose a British bank. It wasn't a money thing. I could have stayed at Morgan Stanley for an extra five grand, but, you know, if they've stopped me doing something once, who's to say they're not going to do it again? And so I moved to Behrens. At that stage, I probably would be happy to say that I'd never heard of Behrens. But it was a famous old bank. So? There's no Behrens in Watford. Behrings was the oldest merchant bank in Britain. It had been run by the Behring family for over 200 years. They were related to practically everyone, including Princess Diana and Tiggy Leg Burke. Working for the bank was a family tradition. I decided to be a banker, not a very conscious decision, when I came down from Oxford in 1950 and had to earn my living and uh, was able to go into bearings and try my hand there. Bearings Power was its name. It could raise capital on the best of terms because everybody knew that its clients were the cream of British society. Even the Queen held an account at Bearings. It was a discreet, safe bank with a deep sense of superiority. Bearings had a wonderful franchise, particularly in Britain, but it was certainly smug, it was certainly arrogant. It had always been at the heart of the establishment. It had always been regarded really very special. You know, I, mean, I, think, I think probably the Bank of England gave it considerable indulgence because it was Bearing Brothers. But Bearings had a terrible secret in its past, something that even today the family are reluctant to talk about. A hundred years ago, the bank sent a young clerk to Argentina. It was the emerging market of its time, and the clerk persuaded Bearings to invest in the building of sewers underneath Buenos Aires. Bearings sent millions of pounds, hoping to sell the shares in Europe. But no one wanted them, and the bank crashed. Bearings was rescued by the Bank of England. But Edward Bearing, the head of the bank, was ruined. He never recovered, and his son and grandson went to live in solitude on an island off the Irish coast, accompanied only by three wallabies bought from London Zoo. The name of the clerk who ruined the bank was Nicholas, Nicholas Bauer. 
Nick Leeson went to work for Bering Securities. Six years before, they had been a small team of stockbrokers. Now they contributed over half the profits of the bank. But behind this 80s success story, Leeson found an operation run on a shoestring. Just a totally different environment. There was, um, you know, at Morgan Stanley, everything was, was new. You know, all of the equipment was new. Um, the furniture was new. At Bearings, everything is, you know, just tacky, I suppose. I, I can't describe it any other way. The Futures and Options Department was operating on a PC and on a software program that was written by one of the people that I worked with. It was very much on the back of matchbox type things. And there were a lot of problems. Leeson had joined an organisation falling apart after the boom of the 80s. He worked as a bookkeeper trying to keep track of the bank's money. And he was good at it. Soon he was sent overseas to sort out problems. In Jakarta, he found huge sums of money owed to the bank by its clients. It was typical bearings. Bearings had paid for a lot of stock and hadn't actually received anything back from the customers. The figure was £100 million. They just didn't have the right people in place to control it and monitor the settlements. You know, they'd go in and do the dealing and everything OK, but then just the back office would fall apart all the time. You know, it was typical bearings. In Jakarta, Leeson met another clerk working for bearings, Lisa Sims. You don't sort of wake up one day and think, I'm attracted to Nick, because you just grow on each other. Things that you, you know, things that Nick could make me laugh. He used to, he, I mean, he is quite funny, he does make you laugh. And he is quite friendly. How ambitious was he? Very. You could just tell, the minute you, like I said, you're in the, working with Nick, he was in control of everything and very ambitious and he wanted to get things done. <laughs> In March 1992, Nick married Lisa. Ten days before the wedding, he had received some good news. He was to be a trader at last. Bearings wanted him to go and run their futures operation in Singapore. Lisa asked Lisa to leave her job and come with him. And she agreed. I thought, yeah, I want to spend the rest of my life with Nick. All I wanted was my little house, a car, 2.4 children, and to be happy. What everyone wants, really, just to be comfortable. And I thought that's what Nick wanted, too. Leeson was going to trade in one of the newest and most exciting of the financial markets, futures. He went to work on CIMEX, Singapore's International Monetary Exchange, in the heart of the city's financial district. Leeson's job was to buy and sell futures. These are bets on the way a market will move in the future. He traded on the Nikkei, the Japanese stock market. He was acting under orders from both the bank and its clients. If the market moved the way they had predicted, they made money. If it didn't, their losses mounted rapidly. Nick is a really cool person on the floor, you won't believe it. And everybody is all excited and anxious and he would be just holding the line and then he just report the figure to the line to, on the other line and then the next moment once he get instruction of selling or buying him he would go shouting to the boy on the floor and they would all listen to him and they would do it very fast and maybe within a minute or whatever he could have buy 500 and sell 500 lots he's real cool real cool it was hard work, you know, there was a lot of pressure. I prefer the pressure, you know, more than anything else. Whether it was the excitement, I can't really say. In the summer of 1992, the market fluctuated violently. In the chaos, Leeson's team began to make serious mistakes. Mistakes are always done by very new traders, new linemen, when the customer say, sell one lot, and then he, she went, buy one lot, you know, instead of putting here, sell one lot like this, and she put like that. So in, instead of selling one lot now, you have to sell 11 lots. Well, do you cover it or don't you cover it? And at the same time, this, the market was sometimes up a thousand points. There were four or five days when it was going up a thousand points in a row. So if you're out 500 contracts and you're looking at a thousand points, you're looking at two and a half million dollars. It's an awful lot of money. And they always go, boss, I make a mistake. And then Nick would go, okay, I settle it. 
There's not a lot I can do with Babby at 11 o'clock on a Friday night. And, you know, by the time Monday comes around, the market's probably opened up a little bit higher. So now the loss has increased. The normal response of a trader would be to tell head office. But instead, Leeson hid the losses. He didn't want to go back to being a clerk. He put the losses into a computerised account, called the Five Eights account, and altered its software so London wouldn't see what he was doing. His only problem then were margin payments. These are small down payments made on every future. The bank later gets the money back from its clients. The only way to get this money was to ask London. So Leeson took a chance. He told head office it was for futures he had bought for clients. But the clients didn't exist. It was a blatant lie. From the first time that I do anything, I'm not expecting to survive any more, anything more than two days. As it, as you obviously, as you get past the two day, two day, uh, the two day period, then you start to get more confidence because it isn't being found. If it's not found after two days, when is it going to be found? To me, it's obvious. If they can't see it after two days, then who says they're going to see it after 200 days, 500 days, 1,000 days? You know, so you start to get a little bit, you don't get confident, but you, you're getting away with it. It's easy. As the weeks passed, London carried on sending Leeson money. They failed to notice that there was no equivalent money coming in from clients. Leeson had discovered a weakness in the system. He would hide his mistakes and trade out of them in his own time. And no one would ever know. But the weakness that Leeson had discovered was just one crack in an organisation that was falling apart. Bering Securities was in crisis. By the summer of 1992, its operating losses were £39 million. The parent bank decided to move in a traditional banker. His name was Peter Norris. How shocked were you by the lack of control in that when you got in there and began to work there? I was shocked. Um... I was shocked. Because I, I didn't feel that it should have been allowed to, uh, to reach that point. It was a clash of cultures. Peter Norris was a merchant banker. He believed in control and good bookkeeping. The culture he met in Bering Securities was that of the 80s, a buccaneering spirit where controls were seen as a hindrance. They stopped you making money. But as Leeson had discovered, this attitude bred chaos. There was a culture which said that businesses of that type operated far better in an informal environment than a formal environment. I think that that was a significant error of judgment. So Leeson's not completely wrong? No. Bering Brothers decided to take over Bering Securities. The cowboys of the 80s were kicked out, and Peter Norris moved his own team in. They set about counting the money and imposing controls. Norris became the chief executive. If he didn't stop the losses, Bering Securities might go bankrupt. If operating losses had continued at the level they were, that could have had a very serious effect on that business's ability to finance itself. Maybe derailed because of that. It was a bad time. Frightening? I find it quite frightening, yes. But the bank's losses were actually much higher than Norris realised. Leeson's deception had gone badly wrong. Throughout the end of 1992, the market had gone against him. As it did so, the losses he had hidden mounted up. The secret 5 8 account turned into a monster with a life of its own. At one point, it held losses of £4 million. A massive loss. I mean, it was, it was a massive loss. But, um, you know, and the margin, the margin payments were increasing. Um, the market was going against me on a, day, on a daily basis. And something had to be done about it. And the loss was just accelerating. You know, it starts to get pretty frightening. You know, I'm, I'm not sleeping at night. But Leeson decided to go on. He took the classic gambler strategy. He doubled up. Secretly, he bought hundreds more futures. 
It was incredibly dangerous and against all the bank's rules. But it meant that if the market did move his way, he would make a great deal of money and wipe out his losses. Why did I choose to go on? Um, what, what is the option to choosing to go on, and to deciding to go on? You know, you, you have to realise the loss. I didn't want to cause bearings to lose all this money. Um, so I'm operating in the belief that I can get it back. You know, maybe it goes back to the confidence thing. I don't know. I mean, I'm confident I can get it back at that stage, I suppose. Then suddenly, in the spring of 1993, the market did move his way. Day by day, he made hundreds of thousands of pounds. And in July, he wiped out his losses. Success, you know, I was elated. Um, you know, I, I mean, we, we had a barbecue at home with some friends and then playing a stupid game afterwards, Pictionary or something like that, all getting pretty drunk around my apartment in Singapore. And, um, you know, I was happy. It, the nightmare was over. There was a big group of us, but we were out on the... We had, like, a little balcony. And Nick just said that he'd been under a lot of pressure at work and that he'd, he'd lost money. And that... But now, you know, he'd recouped the losses and everything was OK. And then he I said, well, how much did you lose? And Nick said, a million pounds. I just told her that we'd had a problem and, um, you know, I'd been covering up a few trades and um, just told her a figure. I don't, I don't know what I used, a million dollars or something. But then reading the book, I find out it was six million. I mean, just as well he didn't tell me it was six million at the time because I think I would have hit the real one, fainted first and, and <laughs> it scraped me up first and then I would have sort of torn him off uh, but I just think oh you know it was just it's unreal that money I mean six mi a million pounds was was terrible to you know I thought oh Nick you know think you know think about us in the future and rather than protecting them and don't do it again and on the Monday he did it again by all accounts why do you think he did that because I don't think he wanted to be seen as a failure. Uh, as, I suppose, the only one, like I said, everyone wants to be seen as a success. I suppose he thought, well, I've done it before and it worked out OK, maybe I can do it again. I don't know why he did it. That's questions I need to ask, Nick. You just lived through nine months of what you described as a nightmare. And here you are, started to do it again. I'm not a psychologist, I can't explain it. But, um... Yeah, I didn't want to let the people down. Leeson started his deception again. But this time, it was not to cover up other people's mistakes. It was a deliberate fraud. He began to use his secret account to give his clients cut price deals. He sold them futures at unreal prices, making a loss for himself. He then took these losses and hid them away in the secret account. My concerns were, here's something that, we've, that we're seeing which we weren't expecting to see where the profitability is growing and one needs to be cynical about growing profits and know exactly how they produced. In May I went down there and, and met the people that were there. What struck you was that he was a complex guy. There was no doubt when you met Nick that he was complicated and that there were things going on below the surface that, that, um, that didn't come out um, in, naturally in conversation. Um, I suppose that my overriding impression was of somebody who was very polite, somewhat um, overly deverent. The man standing in front of Baker was actually hiding losses of £94 million. Throughout the end of 1993, chaotic world events had pushed the market against Leeson. He had tried to double up, but this time it hadn't worked. He was now at the mercy of the market. On some days, he lost more than a million pounds. It was out of hand, you know. The market movements that I'm allowing are increasing at the same time. Everything is increasing, you know. My um, capability to um, accept the loss, the capability to accept a larger market movement, uh, the capability to accept a larger position. Everything increases during the period, you know. Everything's building. I felt we needed to investigate um, the operation and I felt that he as an individual seemed immature and a guy who was, 
who was who was struggling with um, with, the, with with his changing role. But um, did you think he was hiding something? No, I didn't think he was hiding something. I thought he was somebody who was having trouble adjusting to the need to talk to senior people about what he did. Leeson was also being noticed by those in charge of sending him money. As his losses mounted, he told the usual story. The money was for clients. But the new man had noticed there was something wrong. These clients weren't paying their bills. For the first time, an internal audit was being done, and they told the auditors of the problem. In July, the auditors flew to Singapore. By this time, the secret 5-8's account held losses of more than a hundred million pounds. You have to expect um, everything to be found. They're supposed to, you know, an, the nature of an audit is that they're supposed to test information and test documents. Now, if you picked up any document, it had the 5 8 account on it. You know, in some way or form, any document had the 5 8 account on it. So, of course, I'm worried. They come in and they don't test any records. So, I can't be happier. They didn't test one record. One report. Yeah, I mean, it's not an audit. Leeson says that he was convinced he was going to be discovered and it would have been easy to discover him, and they didn't. Right. He portrays himself almost as a passive figure. Do you think that's true? No. Uh, I mean, it, it's only my... It can only be my... Uh, um, speculation about it, of, of course, but I think he conducted a determined, completely unscrupulous and ultimately extremely successful campaign to avoid discovery through that audit. Yeah, it's complete amazement, but um, as you get to know the people at Bearings, you can then understand the amazement. A lot of them are just bumbling fools. And that's not me saying that with hindsight. I think if anybody met them, um, they would get that impression. They come out of some of the reports quite well because they're allowed to say what they like and I don't have an opportunity to answer back and make their comments look stupid, which they are. Well, I, I think he's a, he's a highly intelligent creature with a very highly developed skill in manipulating people around him in a quite extraordinary way. He's like a virus that gets into the workings of something that does work and perverts it utterly. He's an agent of destruction. The auditors returned to London full of praise for Leeson. They worried about his dual role as both trader and bookkeeper but they completely failed to spot the most obvious evidence of his fraud. The money being forwarded to Leeson every day was not being repaid to the bank. There were no clients, but the auditors hadn't noticed. Was it Nick or was it the auditors? I think it's the auditors in the end. Nick would probably have been clever, probably distracted people, but at the end of the day, there's a job there to be done. It seems to me that they began to associate the commercial success of the organisation somehow or other with the lack of controls. You ran a London investment bank with pristine controls which you polished regularly but a global stock stockbroker um, was a very different business and maybe that was a business in which um, you let you let it rock and roll a little bit more than you do than you did with uh, with the merchant bank because that was the way that business had been successfully run. The people that were sent in to fix the controls were seduced by the commercial success of the organisation and lost their way. To the traditional bankers from Bearings, the 80s culture they had taken over was strange and alien, but it was one that was making them a great deal of money, far more than they had made as merchant bankers. But what made that money was a willingness to cut corners and cheat customers. It was a culture that Leeson knew well, where extra profits were often skimmed off clients' accounts. There's a lot of funny stuff that goes on. 
you see it in the back office. I mean, at Bearings, for instance, they have so many different suspense accounts where trades are fed through so that they can book the profits off to different accounts, especially on the futures and options side. That if they looked at those specific accounts, I think that there could be something there that is illegal. Some of the charges that I am currently um, going to be tried on in Singapore, and it's standard practice in the industry. And who wins out of that? The, the company, Bearings. The audit reassured Leeson's new bosses. He was now seen as a clever trader, living the high life in Singapore. But by the autumn of 1994, his secret losses totaled £160 million. And he found himself in a terrible trap. To stop London being suspicious, he had to seem to be making huge profits. In fact, his profits were small. So he did something extraordinary. He used his secret account to buy futures off himself at fantastic prices. By doing this, he was able to fake huge profits. But his hidden losses grew even more. It was a vicious circle. He kept on having to do irrational things that would lose money on the exchange in order to produce the accounting effect necessary to continue to conceal. And so long as he could continue to get the cash, then it didn't matter whether he did things that were unprofitable, because in his own fantasy world, he was a star. You had almost a psychotic sort of figure toward the end of 1994. On the one hand, the powerful trader supposedly making profits. On the other hand, the reality of the continual loser, and having to do irrational things that would lose money. Leeson was now on a merry-go-round. He couldn't get off. Each time he declared more profits, he became more of a star. But in reality, each time he did this, his losses grew. It was an absurd situation, but on the surface, he was supremely self-confident. This film, taken at the end of 1994, shows everyone looking anxiously at the screens, except for one man on the right, Nick Leeson, who was now known as the King of the Exchange. Yeah, it does make you look back and think, obviously, I don't know Nick. I thought I did. I thought I knew him really well. Obviously, there's a side to Nick that I didn't know. I only knew his colleagues and the friends of ours that worked on the floor. And they only ever fed me with success stories saying how well Nick was doing, what a good trader he was. So I just thought things were fine. The fibs, the lies, that's what makes me angry. Why lie? I'm, I'm his wife. I mean, I'm his wife. Why should he lie? I mean, I suppose lots of wives think that when they find out their husbands have been having an affair and they think, well, you know, they've been leading a double life. And that's what it feels like. Not that Nick, Nick's had an affair. It feels like Nick, well, Nick was leading a double life. Leeson was now trapped by his own fake success. It was escalating out of his control. In September, the Singapore Exchange celebrated its 10th anniversary. The guest of honour was Lee Kuan Yew, the country's leader. That night, he announced Singapore's own version of the Big Bang. Due partly, he said, to Symex's recent successes. And now Symex celebrates its 10th anniversary. 10 years of continuous growth in liquidity. Everyone knew that the man behind much of this success was the king of the exchange, Nick Leeson. And Bearings was to receive two awards that night. So it was like a glory day for Bearings. Everybody was so happy and so proud of ourselves. We thought that Nick is the one who's going to receive the prize on the stage, but Nick wouldn't go on stage to receive the award. I mean, I know it's a lie, but um, how did I feel? I, I mean, you know, it, again, it's, it's another thing that's increasing the pressure inside me because it's being opened up to a wider circle and they're seeing this same image, which I know to be so false. Because they weren't, they weren't true profits. The 5 eighths account would have totally wiped out the profits that were being reported. So you were a fraud? Correct. So I don't think he ever really was a traitor. I think that was the fantasy. And to keep the fantasy going, he needed two things. One was the cash from London and the other one was the concealment of the losses. So the concealment um, let him continue to enjoy the fantasy. But when the fantasy broke and he was forced to come back and deal with the fact that uh, he really was 
a loser. What nourishes and sustains him is his ability to fool people, to be able to be one step ahead, to be able to make them believe in something that's created by him as an illusion. Everyone now believed the illusion that Leeson had created. In December, he was flown to New York. Bearings was holding a conference for many of its traders from around the world, and Nick Leeson was the star. He had made, it appeared, £28 million turnover that year. He was held up as the model for the future of the bank, the Cymex model. Lots of people were there, it was probably the biggest sort of thing on this sort of basis that they'd done for bearings. And it really was, I presume, on the back of the profits I was uh, reporting out of uh, Singapore. And there's all these people are doing these presentations and they're thinking, shit, we're going to make a load of money this year, look at how much money Singapore's got. Now, do I need that? No. Leeson faced an audience of executives who badly wanted to believe in him. All of them were to get vast bonuses that year. Some, like Ron Baker, of nearly a million pounds. Much of this was to come from Leeson's profits. But there were traders in the audience who didn't believe Leeson. They couldn't see how such fantastic profits could come from low-risk trading. But Bering's executives dismissed their worries. Is it possible to make such profits for what Leeson was supposed to be doing? Yes. And I think, uh, I th and I think if we had had somebody that was skillful, um, that was earnest, and that was, uh, that was um, attempting to fulfil that commercial strategy um, as honestly as they could within Cymex during that year, that we would have made money, uh, decent money out of, that, uh, out of that activity. Would we have made £28 million? Pounds? Uh, I think it's possible. It is simply not the case that uh, it's impossible for institutions like Bearings to make very considerable profits from financial transactions with very little or virtually no risk. So when people say they should have known that it was impossible to make high profits with low risk, they're wrong? I think they're wrong, yes. The reason that Bearings executives believed there was no risk was yet another deception by Leeson. They thought he had offset all his futures. This meant that for every bet he had made, Leeson had an insurance policy. He had made an equal bet on the market moving the other way. But like all of Leeson's activities, this too was a lie. None of his futures were offset. I'd never queried for, uh, for an instant the basic premise of this business, which was that it was an offset. It never even occurred to me. That, that that fundamental point um, uh, was untrue. Leeson's positions on the exchange were now vast. Every night he asked for hundreds of thousands of pounds in margin payments, and Bearings paid it. Yet those in charge of sending him this money knew there was something seriously wrong. The bank's treasurer, Tony Hawes, knew that there was nothing like this amount coming in from clients. He worried, but he didn't do very much. Those who ran bearings were not only mesmerised by Leeson's profits, they didn't understand the very basics of the business they had taken over. Mr Hawes has declined to be interviewed. So senior managers within Bearings Bank knew that there were vast differences between what Leeson was asking for and what you were being given, yet you were never told? Yeah. Should you have been told? Well, of course, you say, uh, yes, I should, I should. Why didn't you know? Well, fundamentally, because it wasn't raised in that way. Why not? I don't know. I don't know. But why didn't those people who ran bearings come to you and say, what are you doing? Because they're stupid. 
they don't understand the business and they should never have been in the position that they were in especially people like Tony Hawes he was supposed to be controlling the global treasury function he was supposed to understand derivatives he didn't and he would pay the money every single day and would accept you know pretty ridiculous explanations from me it wouldn't happen at Morgan Stanley at Barings they had a lot of idiots basically in every one of the controlling functions they were asking questions but they weren't going deep enough they didn't understand the basics of the business and you were creating a large amount of profits fictitiously yeah but they were also paying me an awful lot of money that they couldn't justify so if you were thinking that the profits were real and yet you were still paying ten times as much in money that you couldn't account for what is the natural conclusion? something is wrong by the end of 1994 the equivalent of three quarters of Baring's capital had been sent to Leeson the oldest merchant bank in Britain had placed 330 million pounds on the activities of one man such was the power of the illusion that Leeson had created that the men who ran the bank began to entertain strange dreams. The chairman, Peter Baring, believed his family bank had returned to the glories of its past. It had recaptured the global position it had lost a hundred years ago. That Christmas, Leeson went on holiday to Ireland with his wife. He decided to tell her they weren't returning to Singapore. I'm trying to tell Lisa that I don't want to go back. Pressure's too much. What does she say? Um, you know, she knows what the bonus figure is. The proposed bonus figure is supposed to be £450,000. It was just this bonus. Imagine, £450,000 is such a lot of money. You know, it would have set us up for the rest of our lives. It, you know, every week I sort of do six, you know, scratch my six number, do my six numbers to think I could have a chance of winning that kind of money. You dream about that kind of money. And to, th to think that Nick had worked so hard to achieve it, and then he said he didn't want to go back. I couldn't understand it, but he couldn't tell me why, and he didn't tell me. I just can't. I can't face up to it. I don't know. You have to ask a psychologist. It's the thing of letting people down. I just can't do it. You know, maybe I try too hard to please. I can't give you an explanation. <laughs> So Leeson returned to Singapore. For a few days in January, things went his way. He had thousands of futures hidden in the secret account. Provided the market kept steady, they could still make a lot of money. The effect of the Kobe earthquake on the Japanese stock market was disastrous. Immediately, the Nikkei began to plunge. It was bad, you know. Um... But again, it's living to fight another day, really. I mean, what did I feel? I didn't go home and cut my wrists. I didn't go and jump out of a building, you know. Some people would do that. But, um, you know, uh, with, without the choice of running away from it, you know, I had to... Um, Bearings were still paying me money, don't forget. They were still paying me masses of money, you know. I mean, we'd ask for sometimes for $100 million. They'd pay it. Leeson decided to take one last desperate gamble. Using Baring's money, he bought thousands more futures. He was single-handedly going to try and hold the market up. If you're desperate enough, and you're that frightened of a huge loss, you take the leap of faith and try to hold up the entire market. You can, you can feel it slipping away. You can feel it slipping out of your hands. But, you know, you, you can't exactly pull it back. You, you do something desperate, like try to buy thousands of futures of contracts and, and, hold a future, and, and hold a market up. In the days following Kobe, Leeson took a terrifying switchback ride on the futures market. If the market moved up only a few points, he made millions of pounds in seconds. So the numbers scared me. I, you know, I wasn't... Uh, I, I didn't really want to know what, what, what the numbers were. 
I was hiding from the numbers as much as possible. I just really, it was out of hand, you know. It was just, it had just gone completely crazy. How it was continuing to go on a day-to-day basis, I just can't explain to you. But Leeson's strategy failed. The market began to fall again. His losses were catastrophic. On one day alone, he lost £50 million. But he kept going. To do so, he needed vast margin payments from London. Every day that I make one of these requests for additional money, I never expect it to come. I expect somebody to say, look, Nick, what the hell's going on? We've got £30 million from our customers, and yet you need £300 million to finance them. How do you explain that? You can't. You literally cannot. How, how, why do you need... Th- what possible explanation could there be for needing £300 million to finance a business that has a total exposure to the market of 30? You can't do it. So, you know, but it, again, it happened. But Leeson was more than the passive figure he portrays himself as. To get this money, he kept on declaring fake profits, but now on a phenomenal scale. In one week, he declared $10 million profit. It was something that no one had ever seen before. But Bearings believed him. I can't explain it because it's not a commercial reaction. I mean, a commercial reaction said, well, you know, how on earth is this man making this money? Um, Nobody else on earth is doing it this way. It defies imagination. A, A trader would know that that could not be achieved. There was either something fundamentally wrong with the market or the man was taking risks, very, very big risks. So how, and it's not just Peter Norris, but Peter Baring, the whole board looked at these results and appear completely to have believed them. I just don't understand it. I was pleased at the success of that business over that period, of course. You know, Mad Hatter's Tea Party. By now, Bearings was scouring the world's money markets to find the money to fund Leeson. But on the 24th of January, they went over their overdraft limit with Citibank, and a meeting was called to discuss Leeson. Worries were expressed about the size of his positions, but the bank's executives agreed amongst themselves that Leeson was doing rather well. His profits were high, they told one another, precisely because of the Kobe earthquake. It had produced chaos in the markets, which Leeson was cleverly exploiting. In retrospect, one has to say that virtually everything about that discussion was absolutely mad. And that we were... We were living in a... In a, in, a, in, a, in, a, in a world through the looking glass where logic was apparent but was actually completely perverted. It seems completely bizarre. A group of rational, intelligent, experienced, competent people were dealing with a matter in, this, in a way which was totally at variance with reality. You mean they were blinded by the prophets? Uh, well, uh, you say, yes, uh, it's a question of degree. I think it, it's more that critical faculties were, were less engaged than they might have been, <laughs> um, to put it at its least, because it, there were profits. But even when the truth stared them in the face, Bering still kept sending Leeson money. The bank's auditors now discovered a £50 million loss which Leeson hadn't managed to hide. Using scissors and glue at home, Leeson concocted paperwork that showed it was a loan to another bank. He faxed it through to the auditors. He forgot that on the top would be printed, From Nick and Lisa. Completely ludicrous, you know, and it doesn't hold up to investigation, but it was accepted. I don't know how, but, you know, it was accepted. Why? I I don't know. I mean, maybe I'm an unbelievable person. I don't know. But then finally, on the 17th of February, a clerk working for Bearings found strange discrepancies in Leeson's accounts. For six days, Leeson eluded him. On the 7th, Leeson decided it was time to go. So I come up with this story about 
uh, Lucy not being well and I need, needing to go home to see her and I'd be back in 45 minutes and we tie up a few loose ends that we had to do and then we leave I mean it was a fight getting Lisa to leave I'm telling her that's a problem I told her it was a problem I didn't go any further than that he said you know I need to have a chat fine you know, so we had to drive in the car and he said that he's under lots of pressure at work if he didn't get away and think about things he'd have a nervous breakdown that's how I rationalised it in the end to her to get her to agree to come We took some golf clubs back that I'd borrowed the week before to one of Lisa's friends. We went to a shop and picked up a deposit that we'd had for laser discs, picked that up. Had a cup of tea and some chocolate biscuits. I went home, packed the suitcases, and we took off to the airport. Good evening. Crisis talks have been going on all day at the Bank of England to work out a deal to save Britain's oldest merchant bank. Bearings is facing bankruptcy after one of its traders lost nearly £400 million on dealings in the Far East. He has now vanished. The Bank of England is racing to arrange a rescue before the Tokyo stock market opens in a few hours' time. Leeson and his wife had fled to a luxury resort on the Malaysian coast. Kota Kinabalu. We just spent a normal weekend in Kota Kinabalu. So you told Lisa? No. Nope. Still waiting to see what the situation is. I never expected bearings to go past. Did you ask yourself at that point why this had all happened? No. It was, you know, a combination of errors. Um, you know, I should have, uh, I should have referred it to people. I didn't, and it escalated. I don't think that there is a simpler explanation. Late on the Sunday night, the Bank of England decided it was impossible to save bearings. Next day, traders pushed the market down. Leeson's losses doubled, from over £400 million to £830 million in one day and the oldest merchant bank in Britain was no more. Two days later, Nick and Lisa left Kota Kinabalu for Frankfurt. Did you talk on the flight? No. No, we didn't talk. Actually, I don't really talk on a flight anyway. Wherever I'm going, I'll just watch the film and, and sleep. I'm not being funny, but I didn't want to be talking about it. I didn't want to know. I just didn't. Why not? Because I suppose I didn't want it to be real. For you know, a boy from Watford to bring a grand firm down, I mean, it was a social insult as well. It wasn't even one of their own kind. <laughs> Which is where I suppose the smugness comes in, isn't it? It, could, it simply can't happen to chaps and men like us. You know, in, in bearings. Well, things like that didn't happen. <laughs> I mean just didn't happen. Are to bearings or to banks? Well, it does happen to banks. Um, not, not always the same way, but it, it does. Uh, no, to bearings. And we found one of Nick's photographs in the, in the drawer. And we put Nick's photograph up and we say, Nick, we do respect you. He can do it. Who can do it? Nobody else can do it to bring down such a big bank. And remember, he spoke to some of the traders and they all say, oh, what would you like to be? And he say, I would never want to be rich. I want to be famous. I want to be well like." And so when things happen, we say, oh, Nick, you made it. <laughs> what would be your, your message tonight to Peter Baring, if he's watching? Uh, <laughs> I don't know. I, I, I mean, I, I don't really have a message to Peter Baring. I, I felt the Frost interview was very controlled. I think we're still probably seeing mirrors.
and we're probably still seeing somebody who feels powerful in his ability to fool us and is sustained by that and however naive and stupid this may sound I was always working in the best interests of the bank um, I think he's difficult. a guy who is living out a dream playing out his fantasy as the rogue trader when in reality he's just an accountant cooking the books you keep making excuses that's all we keep on doing is making excuses and sometimes I'm cheesed off we keep making excuses and I think why should we keep making excuses you know you I just want to ask Nick it's no good us keep saying what I think is no one knows unless Nick until Nick actually says well the reason I did it was Maybe he doesn't even know himself. I really don't care what people think. I don't care what you think. I don't care what the average man in the street thinks. I think that they are typically on my side. That's the impression I get from the letters um, that I receive while I'm in here. But um, it's not something that really matters to me. Why are they on your side? I don't know. Ask them. Well, what are you then? If you don't care about what people think, what are you like? Uh, <laughs> why does it matter? You know, the only people that really, that, to, to answer that question, the only people that I'm really answering that question to are the people who, care, who matter to me. And, you know, I don't think it's a question that's worth answering. Double your money and try to get rich. Double your money without any hitch. Double your money, it's your lucky day. Double your money and take it away.